So I'd like to welcome all participants to the fourth and final Transparency Matters webinar of 2020. And today is the 9th of December, um, and it's also International Anti-Corruption Day. So this is a day when we aim to raise public awareness of corruption and what we can do to fight it. Uh, this week is also Contract Transparency Week at the ITI, ahead of the deadline of the 1st of January, from when the 55 countries that implement the EITI will be required to publish new and amended contracts. And knowledge of the terms of contracts is potentially a very powerful tool in the fight against corruption. It helps promote responsible investment and in these very uncertain times, it can also help strengthen resource collection, uh, revenue collection from the resource sector. It is this um, aspect and very important impact of contract transparency that we are planning to explore today in our webinar. And before we start, I'm just going to move on. Um, if you can move the slide on, Rachel, to some practical arrangements. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of USAID um, in our contract transparency work and also in the activities around contract transparency week. Um, I'd also like to remind participants that this webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording will be available on YouTube after the event. <clears throat> and we're also live, live streaming the event on Facebook. Uh, participants will be on mute throughout the event. Um, and we'd also ask panelists also to, to be on mute when you're not talking. Um, but if we can ask you please to stay on camera, that would be fantastic if you are comfortable with that. It's great to see you all and great to see you all on camera. Um, there is a chat function on Zoom. Um, so you're welcome to use the chat function to raise any technical issues and we'll try and help you resolve them. Um, there is also a Q&A function. Um, and we now have well over 100 participants on the webinar and we also have well over 300, 300 registered today. Um, so it's a great opportunity for it to hear all your questions and comments and we'll be making time throughout the webinar um, to bring in your questions, bring in your co comments. So please do post them on the chat um, and please do um, make that a, a conversation um, that's interactive. Um, on the top right uh, of the screen, you'll see our hashtag for the Open Deals 2021 campaign, um, which is a campaign that we kicked off in this week, tra Contract Transparency Week, and we'll be running into next, into next year to highlight the importance and raise awareness of, of the need for contract transparency. Um, so please do use that hashtag on social media. Um, <clears throat> and our moderator today is Lisa Sachs. Uh, who will be well known to many of you. Lisa is the director of the CCSI, the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. And she's been in that role since 2008. Um, and Lisa, we're very grateful to you for taking on this moderator role today. We really appreciate it. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you um, to introduce the speakers and to take us through today's program. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joanne, um, to my EITI friends and colleagues, um, and to all of you joining. I'm truly honored to be here to facilitate this discussion. Um, as Joanne said, the main focus for our discussion today is the importance of contract transparency in domestic resource mobilization and why the COVID crisis is highlighting the urgency of contract disclosure for resource-rich countries. Um, I was just hearing about the very strong response to this webinar. I understand we have over 300 participants registered from over 30 countries, many, I think, joining um, after the recording because it's in the middle of the night. Uh, but to me, that's really an indication of the importance and timeliness of this topic. So thank you for taking the time to attend and for EITI for bringing us together. Um, I am really the sideshow here. I'm so honored to be able to facilitate a discussion among these really fantastic panelists. Um, as you can see, we're joined today by Minister Francis Algali, the Minister of State in the Office of the Vice President uh, in Sierra Leone, by Don Hubert, the President of Resources for Development, by Mark Van den Honert, the Global Tax Policy Manager for Shell, by Mr. Turad, the Co-Founder and President of Transparency International Mongolia and the National Coordinator for Publish What You Pay Mongolia, um, and by Diana 
Kaisi, the executive director of the Lebanese Oil and Gas Initiative in Lebanon. I'm very sorry for mispronouncing your names and please correct me when you speak, but thank you very much for joining. I'm really, really excited to hear your perspectives. Let me just very quickly set the scene. The COVID crisis has among other things raised the urgency and the importance of good governance of the natural resource sector both because of the vulnerabilities of impacted communities to all aspects of the crisis and to the sector, but also because of the importance of the sector for many countries' economic recovery. Realizing the benefits from extractive resources is critical to mobilizing revenues for development and to respond even more now to the pressing healthcare, economic, and social needs. In this context, contract transparency plays a critical function it supports governments in implementing these critical and complex projects, and it helps citizens understand and monitor compliance with the terms, obligations, and payments that are connected to these extractive projects in their countries. Citizens have a right to know the terms on which resources are extracted, and also at the national level, the efficient management of tax regimes depends on sharing the information on contractual obligations of companies among government agencies. And I should note also that subnational payments and social expenditures um, are vital to maintaining communities th through the current crisis. And we'll hear more about the role that contract transparency can, pay, uh, can play with monitoring those as well. I was just um, remarking with my fellow panelists earlier um, what a transformation this, this uh, particular topic has seen over the past decade. Contract transparency has really rapidly progressed from being a frontier issue on the natural resource governance agenda to a global norm. We're also meeting, I want to note, um, on the day after Anti-Corruption Day, in which many important voices highlighted how extractive sector transparency can support achievement of the sustainable development goals and of a recovery from COVID. EITI's chair, Helen Clark, um, in particular, emphasized in a statement yesterday that along with beneficial ownership and revenue disclosures, that contract transparency is a critical component of the suite of transparency norms and tools that are necessary to enable governments and communities to benefit from their resources. So as you have already seen, we will hear the perspective today from government, from civil society, and from companies on why contract transparency is key in strengthening revenue collection in a, in a time of crisis. I also want to underscore what Joanne said. I'm very much hoping this will be a discussion both among the panelists, but also with all of you. Um, and I will be watching for um, questions uh, that are posed. So please, um, please do post your questions um, and, and we'll, uh, I'll integrate them as I can and especially hope to leave time at the end. So with that, let me welcome you again and thank you and hand it over immediately to Don Hubert who will be the first speaker um, on the panel. Don, can I hand it to you? Yes, Lisa, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, my uh, role in this is really as a daily user of extractive sector contracts. I run a company that helps countries and communities secure a fair share of natural resource wealth. And as part of that process, we day in, day out, analyze the terms of contracts and try to assess whether deals are fair, what future revenues might look like, um, and, uh, and how to ensure that that money ultimately gets to the recipients. It's a great day, I think, for EITI on the 1st of January when contract disclosure will become a mandatory requirement. It's a key milestone. I wanna make three points in the few minutes that I have. First, I wanna talk briefly about the importance of contract transparency in general terms. Lisa mentioned that it's of course important for citizens to have the right to know. I would say from a revenue transparency perspective that Contract disclosure is not a, a, a next frontier. It's not an important additional step. It's fundamental to the entire enterprise of revenue transparency. We don't wanna just know what amounts of revenues were paid. We wanna know why those amounts were paid. And the only way that you can start to answer those questions is to know the terms of the contracts. Domestic resource mobilization is always an important issue on, in the extractive sector. And as Lisa mentioned, it's of course, particularly important in the midst of COVID and the price collapse. I wanna make a couple of quick points about why contract transparency is central. And one of them is that government officials need to have access 
to the contracts in order to do their jobs. And we work in countries where the tax authority doesn't have access to the contracts, where the Supreme Audit Institutions don't have access to the contracts. We work in places where parliament and parliamentary committees don't have access to the contracts. So I would say that making contracts public is crucial for that public, uh, public systems to operate effectively. In terms of a fair deal, it's also crucial to have contracts be public. We work in countries where governance is very challenging. And we see that in some countries that routinely disclose their contracts, the contracts are good. And in some countries where contracts are not disclosed, there are shocking provisions that could not possibly survive the light of day. No one would have agreed to them if they would have known that the contract was going to become public. And I'd say in particular that in the COVID era, there's a risk of offering fiscal concessions from a government perspective to keep projects going that could have decade long implications. And those potential uh, concessions need to be carefully scrutinized. And the best way for that to happen is if everyone knows that the terms are ultimately immediately going to become public. Let me transition then briefly for a discussion of the importance of disclosing past contracts, not just future contracts. Because of course the EITI standard is brilliant as we look forward, but the most important contracts for the next decade of domestic resource mobilization are the contracts that have already been signed. I'm gonna say that again. The most important contracts are the ones that have already been signed because we know the timelines to develop an extractive sector project are very long. And so the revenues that are coming in today are coming from contracts that were signed five, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's crucial for these contracts to become public. And one of the really interesting provisions is that amendments, all future amendments need to become public. And that means that the underlying document itself should become public because the amendment doesn't often mean very much in the absence of the underlying contract. And here I think there's a great opportunity because it's easy for companies and governments to simply say in the amendment that they all agree that the underlying contract should become public. It overcomes any concerns about confidentiality clauses. Let me turn in the last minute and a half that I think I have left to talk about the importance of capacity building for contract analysis. Putting contracts in the public domain in and of itself is a huge governance win, but we can get much more out of public domain contracts if people know how to analyze them. And frequently when I talk about this, people say, yes, we need to do training with civil society. And I do lots of training with civil society, but I would come back to those government institutions that need to be able to do their jobs. Finance ministries frequently don't understand the contracts well enough. Tax authorities, supreme audit institutions, central banks. So I think there's a huge capacity building challenge here. And I think the EITI lesson is that it's not just about putting information in the public domain. It's about skilling people up to make use of that information. And this takes us down the path, I think, of project level economic analysis, of economic modeling, my organization, others, Lisa's organization does this kind of work. Um, so I'll bring it to a close just by saying what I said at the very start. Contract transparency is not just an ancillary benefit as part of the revenue transparency movement. It is at the center. We need to understand what the terms are in, un in order to understand why the revenue payments are the way they are. With that, I'll thank you. Thank you so much, Don, so much there. And actually, on one hand, a great transition to Diana's remarks, but I want to jump in with a two-part loaded question um, and giving you only 30 seconds to respond to it. You, you mentioned, I think, a really important point, which is that contract transparency not only helps with the implementation of, of contracts, but can be decisive in getting a good contract in the first place. Um, I have a two-part question, which is whether you have any perception of whether this is a um, which comes first, that good contracts are likely to be disclosed or that um, knowing that contracts will be disclosed uh, you know, is, is more likely to yield a good deal. And, and the second part of that question is how to manage then um, the urgency, as you said, and the importance of disclosing past contracts when those past contracts were negotiated um, without the sunlight of disclosure. Um, how can kind of um, 
what we might uncover be managed um, in light of that? I think those are really challenging questions. There's no question in my mind that that contract transparency generates good governance looking forward. If people know that the terms are gonna be in the public domain, they will be more careful. I have seen shocking provisions in contracts in recent years, things that I thought were the, you know, part of the history of the 1970s and they've been signed within the last 10 years. Um, they would not survive the, uh, the light of day, as I mentioned. I think there is a real challenge here because part of the concern about disclosing old contracts is that some of them have problematic provisions and some of them do not uh, um, shed positive light on the people that negotiated them. But I think that these projects in many cases are so fundamental to national economies that it's not about a few individuals being concerned about their reputations. It should be parliaments, legislatures, uh, the Office of Presidents and Vice Presidents who push this forward uh, because they are so fundamental ultimately to getting a better deal. And, and I would say ultimately that in some cases, maybe very rare cases, this is going to involve contract renegotiation. And I think we shouldn't shy away from that. We should be very careful about it. We should be very respectful of the companies and the positions that they were in when they made their investments. But we shouldn't shy away from the fact that there are some fundamentally problematic contracts out there that will need to be fixed. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'll pick up on your last point about the importance of contract analysis and the ability to analyze contracts to hand over to Diana Kaisi, if you can um, share with us your experience about how contract analysis can help to inform citizens about the fairness of deals. Absolutely, and thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, so uh, let me take what you know, uh, my colleague uh, talked about contract transparency and bring it down to the granular level of so, okay, we had the contracts uh, uh, published, and then what? Um, let me be, first of all, let me set very briefly in one minute the stage. What, where are we working? We're working in Lebanon, a collapsed state, economically, uh, security-wise, is, uh, is we're in, in a very red uh, zone, alert zone. Uh, we uh, are situated in the East Med, where all around us, we have a lot of um, activities, extractive activities happening in the sea. Now, Lebanon is very recent to the game. When we started back in 2014, talking about the need to disclose our yet to be signed contracts, uh, we were not received as civil society by a lot of uh, appreciation or understanding, but um, our approach, the multi-stakeholder approach to getting the different stakeholders, whether it's the government, the companies, and of course we were helped by Total's claim back in 2018, uh, supporting contract disclosure did help help us to um, succeed in getting the government uh, to say, okay, now that we had our contracts disclosed in 2017, uh, in uh, sorry, signed in 2017, we're going to disclose them. And they did that in March of 2018. Now, um, with Lebanon's economic downfall, the oil and gas sector is proposed as the savior of the economy. And it was was very important for civil society to reposition this discussion to avoid what we now know as the pre-source curse. Um, should we all wait for the oil and gas money revenues that might or might not trickle in in a couple of years or in seven to eight years or go for reforms first? Is it really our savior? And this is where contract disclosure really helped us. So we viewed contract disclosure as a milestone, transparency in it, and not as an end in itself. So we said we need to, first of all, be able to properly understand and analyze what we have signed off to. And the best way that we chose uh, or what really fit our purpose was to develop a um, uh, financial models that help us really understand what are we looking at? What are the different scenarios? Bringing it down to the very basic level of understanding if we find an A type of discovery, this means that we're going to have probably plus and plus so and so proceeds in the coming future, you know, building scenarios just to understand what are we expecting when we say the oil and gas sector will help us. And what we ended up with was really debunking the myth of 
the oil money helping Lebanon and helping the policymakers more focus on the needed and urgent reforms um, uh, that should be taken by the different entities, the state in itself, we're talking about the reforms needed to be taken by the government, by the um, policymakers, the legislators, and of course, by civil society itself. So it really helped us re uh, stage the scene on what it means uh, to have the uh, revenues coming in. And this for Lebanon is, is the li lifeline itself, um, putting all our eggs in one basket, saying that oil and gas will save us. This is not the way to go. And how do we debunk this political rhetoric is by looking at the contracts that were disclosed, managing our expectations, because if we don't manage our expectations, then the dire consequences will be fatal for us. It will be the last blow. And um, making people at the same time, allowing them to really understand what they have signed on to. Just a final remark, and I'd like to link it to what um, Ron said at the end. We really do, this is the time where everything because of Corona is being renegotiated. And understanding what we have signed on the parameters that it allows for us will help us also have an informed opinion when the governments ultimately may, may be most probably sitting at the table talking about contract redrafting or contract renegotiations. We're not there yet, but it does give us that elevated ground of really understanding what, are, what would the government be negotiating on our behalf. We're more aware of what's going on we do now understand what contracts are all about. We have a tool, a physical tool, that will help us understand what we signed on and what we're about to sign on in the future. And most important of all, it has helped the Lebanese really manage their expectations and not just to wait for Godot when it comes to the revenues, but to focus on the more urgent stuff, which are reforms. So that will be my intervention, waiting for your feedback. Thank you so much, Dana. That's an incredible example. Um, I, I, one question that really jumps out to me um, is we were talking about how governments can use the information in contracts and benefit from contract transparency, how citizens can use it to help uh, inform their analysis. But I think you've really highlighted how contract transparency can facilitate um, a dialogue between mm -hmm. the two. Um, so I was wondering if you could just say anything more about your experience with how contract transparency has facilitated the engagement of civil society with the policymakers um, or with the media or with others, because I think that its ability to foster those interconnections is important to understand. Absolutely, absolutely. Our key entry point or the, the um, spark that led us to sit all together uh, collectively to talk about the contracts and what they mean were actually the fake news that were put there uh, by one entity or another to push policymakers towards a certain direction, which is, you know, for getting uh, reforms. And um, we used the solid um, facts that came out and the, the you know, the, reali the reality that we had from these contracts to say, this is, you know, these are the facts. We can sit together and discuss facts as different stakeholders to come out with a, um, a resolution that will help everybody involved around the table uh, to come out with a unified uh, opinion. The basis, or you can say the table that helped us all get together were the actual contracts that were disclosed. Nobody could have an opinion about them. They were facts. And we started talking to each other. And that's the first when it comes to Lebanon, believe me, and all the conflicts that we have, because we had a fact to start and a reality. And this was the real contract that were signed. Nobody could negate these. So this is how we're using it. We're hoping that we'll have further clarity also on the, on the contract signed at the subcontractual level. But that's, again, another advocacy that we're carrying on with. So yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark, uh, if I can turn to you for bringing in the really critical government, uh, sorry, the company perspective on how contract transparency can facilitate uh, uh, resource mobilization. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you also to the uh, EITI for inviting Shell to participate in this panel discussion today on contract transparency. I would emphasize that contract transparency is indeed very important to industry and even more so to industry, I think, that touches on country resources. But before I you know, elaborate a bit more on that, let me start with looking back on what has been an extraordinary year so far with the COVID-19 pandemic that continues to, to have a serious impact on people's health, 
many jobs, businesses, livelihoods that continue to be impacted around the world. And also for us, also for Shell, the unprecedented macroeconomic impact of COVID-19 has led to significantly weaker demand for oil, gas, and other resources, and lower prices, of course. And that obviously has a negative impact on government revenues at a time when economies and healthcare support systems really require help. And it is, I think, where tax and transparency are both factors that should not be overlooked in the discussion. I think it's good to see that, and you may have noticed that, that, that BP um, have issued their tax transparency report earlier today. I think that's a good development. The more and more companies will follow, the better society will hopefully understand the tax payments we make as companies and the way we contribute to society. When we invest in a, in a country or, or location, we really seek to build long-term relationships and develop our business sustainably. We recognize our responsibility towards investors, towards governments, towards employees, but also towards the local communities that we are part of. And the taxes we collect and pay are just one item um, uh, with which we show the responsibility that we care about. And I'd like to make one, one quote that was made by Jessica Wu, our CFO, um, when she joined the global conference of the EITI in Paris in June of last year, um, where she said, not only is it important for Shell as an international energy company to show what we've paid in taxes, but we also want people to understand why we have paid that amount. And that's why Apart from being open about taxes ourselves, we encourage governments to join EITI and share contracts and licenses. EITI enables reliable information to governments, companies, and society. It really offers a platform where governments and companies can be held accountable. And I think that was a really strong, um, a really strong statement. And to me, that shows that, that contract transparency in the energy um, industry is particularly important also because of the sheer size and impact of our industry. I mean, energy companies are really an important resource of revenue to many, many countries around the world. Just to give you one example, Shell alone paid more than 13 billion in corporate income tax and royalties around the world last year. And we also collected on behalf of governments, some 48 billion in excise duties, sales taxes, and, and similar levies. So the significance of the industry and revenue generated in country has a real impact on people's lives. There are, of course, and I think uh, others have, have touched upon that as well, there are, of course, some in the energy industry who may be concerned about the potential impact of, of contract transparency. I mean, for, for example, the, uh, the confidentiality provisions um, that might be breached, uh, or some might think that commercially sensitive data might be disclosed to the, to the broader um, audience. I mean, I understand, those, um, I understand those concerns. But what I'd like to say is that what we feel is important is that that first of all, companies respect the laws of the land in, in which they operate and the role of host governments in these countries. Just as we respect, you know, our host um, when visiting someone's home, no difference. We, we, we believe that the process of, of contract transparency should be led by host governments, but we are, of course, very much open to discussion and to help relevant stakeholders. We also believe that EITI provides a very good platform for data disclosure, but also, you know, the multi-stakeholder platform to really foster dialogue and build trust. And that is, I think, um, what is beneficial to companies like ours. But it's not just about disclosing contracts. And I think that was a remark made by Don as well. It's, it's also about providing 
the right context to people as to make them as to make them understand why the data is what it is and why and how the data help economies to flourish so i think that we uh, what we need is a comprehensive approach for transparency to really contribute to domestic resource mobilization and that is i think where eiti the eiti approach is most valuable thank you Thank you very much, Mark. Um, as you noted, it's not all um, industry actors who are speaking openly about the positive benefits of contract transparency. So um, I might push you on one point, which is that in light of the fact that you, there are other peers who still resist, um, and also that Shell has taken the position of encouraging governments to take the lead on contract transparency, um, but agreeing to follow when that lead is taken. I'm wondering if you can give maybe concrete ideas for uh, leader industry players who are open to and see the benefits of contract transparency and what role Shell and others can take in 2021 to, um, to advance the implementation of the norm and to make your peers feel more comfortable, but, and also to, um, to push disclosure from your country partners as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is that is probably a question, uh, Lisa, that is on on, on many people's minds, um, <laughs> and it's it's and it's also not it's also not an easy one. I mean, that's um, I'll be the first one to to recognize that this is not an um, that this is not an easy discussion. But what I do think, and that is that is maybe maybe let me give. Maybe let me give the example of, of our tax contribution reports, our country by country report. I, I completely recognize it's not the same as, as contract transparency, but you know, I think that, that, that when we decided to publish our country by country tax data, that was a significant step for us as a company, but it was also um, you know, doing things differently than we were used to. And that, and that comes with, you know, that comes with uncertainty. And, and people generally don't like uncertainty. My company is no different from that um, from that perspective. But what what we you know what we saw when we when we published the report was an overwhelmingly positive response. And I think that's uh, you know also what what our CFO um, often often refers to the fact that you have an open dialogue with you know with with the stakeholders and and with the multi stakeholder group for example you know, that really, that open dialogue really builds trust. And I think that is something where, where companies like ours can benefit from. And, and, and that, that's, so, that's probably my message to, to other companies. Think about building trust and how that could benefit um, your company from the broader perspective. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna pick up on one thing you said and turn immediately to um, Francis Algali. Um, you noted that the reception, even when uh, disclosure has been uncomfortable, that the reception has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, I'm wondering if I can ask that of Francis Algali, because Sierra Leone has taken the steps to disclose contracts um, and it'd be great to hear how, how the reception was. Um, uh, and any more that you can share from a government perspective in particular on how contract disclosure um, could help to mobilize revenues um, nationally and especially for local communities. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion. Like you rightly said, Sierra Leone has gone a step ahead before the requirements on 1st January to publish a number of mining contracts. And this was enabled by some legislation that were enacted in 2009 and the Right to Information Act of 2013, and also the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act. Through this enabling le legislation, which support contract disclosure, a number of contracts have been published online by the National Minerals Agency and the Ministry of Mines and Mineral Resources. And I must say this has had a huge impact in terms of uh, 
transparency and accountability. And in terms of the awareness and mobilization of resources, both at the national level, but also at the subnational level, particularly at the community level, where there were huge expectations from mining concessions. So now that the people are aware of some of the payments that were required by the mining companies under these contracts through these disclosures, there has been a less um, confrontational attitude, both on the part of government and on the part of, of uh, the companies. And people have been able to interrogate more their local leaders, their community leaders, as to the resources and as to the benefits derived from this uh, um, mining contracts. But also the fact that the mining contracts have been disclosed has made people empowered to believe that they have a right to those information. Previously, those information were sh shrouded in secrecy, but now that it's all open and it's all transparent and there are people who can come to them and say, this is what is in your contract and this is what in, is in the contract. It has more or less um, lifted the veil of secrecy around the uh, mining contracts. But also through the publishing of mining contracts, we have been able to enhance uh, transparency and accountability and corruption issues. For example, one mining contract currently, that's the Sierra Rutile mining contract, is currently a subject of a commission of inquiry and litigation in the courts by the Anti-Corruption Commission because the contract was disclosed and people were able to see some of the clauses in the contract and interrogate the clauses on the contract. Another contract also with SL Mining Company, a recent contract which was disclosed, is also currently the subject of negotiations with the government in terms of resource mobilization and in terms of the, the terms of the contract. So from a government perspective, we see this as a posi positive step as far as transparency and accountability is concerned. And also we see it as a positive step in our people as citizens understanding why some of these contracts are negotiated and what are in the terms of these contracts. And recently, for example, when a new contract has been negotiated by the Ministry of Mines and Minerals Resources, both the government and the contractors, the company, were, were in the communities informing the community stakeholders about the terms of the contract and informing them that this con contract would be published online and everything would be done in a transparent ma manner. So this has had a positive impact on the way we do the extractive industry business in Sierra Leone, and we hope to continue in this vein. Even though by 1st of January 2022, discussion is that most of these communities and most of our citizens, particularly in Sierra Leone, are uneducated and illiterate. So most of the time, they depend on stakeholders like civil society, like government, and I would call them middlemen, to disclose and explain the terms of the contract to them for them to properly understand. So it's like there's an intermediary, there's a, there's a, a go-between, a middleman between the actual citizens and between the companies and the government. So if, for example, there is misinformation or there's lack of transparent information, who bears the responsibility in terms of disclosing of this contract? The government would go ahead and publish the contract online, but translating the terms of the contract to the citizen is left with a variety of stakeholders. Somebody in the discussion mentioned that there is need for capacity building 
of the stakeholders to explain the contract and to analyze the contracts to see that people better understand the terms of the contract. Because disclosure is one, but understanding of the terms of the contract is another one that we really need to look at. And when we think about the implementation of the EITI requirements come 1st January, what would the EITI be assessing? The number of contracts published online or how this contract is impacting on the transparency and accountability in the communities or how the disclosure of those contracts are being used by various stakeholders to enhance understanding of the, the, the extractive industry or to understand how revenues are being mobilized. So that is something we need to look at. And also, whose responsibility is it to take on that role in terms of educating the public? Is it the government's responsibility? Is it the responsibility of civil society? Or is it the responsibility, for example, of the flight in my country, EITI. And if we are going to take on that road, what capacity or what support is going to be given to us to take that to take on that road? So these are my few thoughts as we go ahead in terms of contract transparency. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I think that you previewed the critical conversations that all of us will be having in 2021 about, um, about the mm -hmm. tools uh, and the roles of various stakeholders that will make the norm um, both actionable and meaningful uh, for the various stakeholders. So, um, so I think you're absolutely right and look forward to that conversation. We've had one mm -hmm. uh, relevant question I, I was hoping you might address from the audience, um, Joseph Bardwell uh, was asked, it was noting, and um, this has been a concern, I think, for many in this sector this year, that, uh, that many civil society groups around the world in various countries face threats or, or worse um, when they speak up um, against or ask questions even about the projects that are most impacting them. And I wonder, um, Francis, if you have views on how to create um, a supportive environment where civil society can have this open conversation um, and or how we should address the risks that civil society are facing um, all over. Okay, one, one of the, the things we can do is have enabling legislation, for example, to protect civil society, like the Freedom of Information Act that uh, Sierra Leone has that um, legalizes the the demand for information on some of these these uh, contracts so once you have the enabling legislation it makes it legitimate for civil society to do their work also there are now in some jurisdictions the enactment of human rights defenders laws and human rights defenders uh, policies to protect um, human rights defenders who or civil society organizations who um, uses contract uh, disclosures to inform their stakeholders. So one of the, the, the things I would encourage um, civil society organizations is to lobby and to push um, us governments for these enabling legislations and these enabling policies that would protect civic space and would protect uh, um, civil societies as they go about their work. I come from a background of uh, human rights. Like I said, I used to work in the Human Rights Commission before becoming a minister. And one of the things, the last things we were lobbying for was the enactment of a human rights defender law that would protect uh, civil society organizations and, and uh, human rights defenders, particularly those dealing with business and human rights human rights, because we recognize that they are more um, vulnerable in terms of, of, of uh, reprisals and violence when they are dealing with uh, businesses. So uh, one of the ways in which we can protect them is to have these enabling legislations and policies that would protect them. Thank you so much. That sounds like it uh, needs to be added to the suite of discussions um, for implementation. Thank you so much. 
Um, Tarad, I'll now turn to you realizing it's the latest in the evening for you. And I think that you may have some slides. I'm not sure if you are able to share or our colleagues at EITI. Uh, sure, I have sent you, but I can show on this screen. Uh, so let me start uh, while I'm putting the, uh, uh, I just have uh, three slides. Uh, so I think uh, what I would like to focus my intervention as a panel speaker is more uh, on the role of the civil society, uh, especially uh, in local communities, you know, what's their uh, benefit from the, uh, let's say, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, contract disclosure. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we had a, a long road uh, to this uh, issue. Uh, as we all know, uh, since uh, uh, 2013, uh, when the EHA started very much strongly uh, uh, advocate and promote contract dis disclosure as uh, one of the key principles uh, and especially with regard to the benefiting the uh, the citizens and especially the local uh, what are in, in particular, uh, uh, we uh, uh, we also uh, started uh, back in uh, uh, if I remember correctly in uh, exactly six years back in uh, uh, December two thousand uh, 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 two thousand fourteen when we had a first a multi-stakeholder uh, forum, uh, uh, including the, with the participation of uh, local uh, citizens and local community representatives from nine uh, mining uh, area provinces uh, on the contract disclosure. And one of the key, uh, uh, I think discussion points was, what's the, uh, uh, how it's, uh, okay, the contract disclosure is, is fine, you know, especially the exploration and the mining. Uh, contracts, uh, let, let's say for the revenue, uh, let's say purposes for the government. But the key question, especially from our local communities, uh, uh, the citizens who are living in the remote rural areas was how it's going to uh, benefit them, you know, directly. And of course, this is, I think, very much, uh, uh, I think, uh, pertinent uh, question. And, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and, and especially, uh, uh, let me give you just one figure, you know, uh, in two, uh, 2012, uh, uh, 2012, we had a just one uh, community development agreement or local level, uh, let's say, contract, you know, when uh, there's a direct, uh, let's say, negotiation and agreement uh, between the, uh, the investor, uh, mining investor company and the uh, local uh, administration, you know, the local government and including the uh, local councils. So as of, uh, um, of course this year there has not been anyone because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation, but uh, uh, by December uh, 2019, uh, there were already uh, 88 new uh, community development agreements uh, uh, made. And, and currently uh, what the, uh, and what we realized that it's the actually uh, the community development agreements which benefit directly the local communities, uh, because, and and uh, this we we have been uh, advocating actually since uh, um, uh, joining the EITA back uh, uh, Mongolia as a country back in two thousand six, uh, 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 especially the importance of uh, entering into local level uh, 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 agreements development. And, and the, we also, to the civil society advocacy, but also direct, let's say, work of the, especially our uh, multi-stakeholder uh, group uh, of the EITA, uh, with the strong uh, initiative of the civil society. Uh, and, uh, and, and most of us, actu us actually, the ministry uh, represent also, especially the, our published what to pay coalition Mongolia, represent the local uh, communities and local community-based, uh, uh, let's say, organizations. What we've been pushing is a legislative mandate, you know, for the, uh, both the uh, contract, uh, let's say, uh, uh, community development agreements, uh, 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 conclusion and negotiation, but also disclosure. So with regard to the, uh, 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 at least with regard to the mandatory, uh, let's say, legal requirement to enter into the 
uh, uh, the local development agreements have been done uh, by the government uh, under our pressure in 2006. And uh, in, in 10 years, in 2016, we were able to uh, get the cabinet approval of the model development ag agreement. So, so what's the, uh, the back to the our point, you know? Uh, so how the, uh, the resource uh, contracts disclosure, especially with regard to the uh, uh, community development agreements, you know, the, the, the benefit uh, uh, the local communities, uh, basically the ordinary uh, citizens, you know? Uh, so of course uh, we uh, we had uh, this uh, model platform for the contract disclosure. Uh, uh, we actually for our uh, guiding uh, actually uh, let's say model was the uh, Mex uh, Mexico's uh, the hydrocarbon uh, commissions uh, portal, and 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 I think we we still believe it's the, it's the best. And if you go to the next uh, slide. Uh, 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 we did this um, uh, platform developed uh, for the past six years. So as you see, it's uh, based on responsive web design. Uh, basically people, especially in, in rural countryside, mostly use uh, Android uh, phones, you know, uh, including accessing the, to the Facebooks uh, as a main, uh, let's say, means of uh, information exchange. It's also enabled to be operated in multiple languages. Uh, because we have also a, a small Kazakh uh, minority national, and also it's uh, interfaced with the main website of our EHA Mongolia. And of course, uh, uh, for the user friendliness, uh, any uh, PDF or photo files could be uh, uh, formatted into Word text because most of the contracts, including the community development agreements, were in PDF format. And of course, I think the uh, it's an open source technology. So if you go to our uh, my last uh, slide. Uh, so, uh, in December uh, last year, we had uh, just uh, less than 37 uh, contracts disclosed accessible publicly. And as of uh, uh, this month, we have 786 contracts. So, just in a one year. And out of this, uh, 167 uh, are actually the community development uh, agreements. So by be, being able to access, especially uh, at the local level, you know, uh, the local people, the community development agreements, they able to actually hold both the uh, mining company, but as well as the local governments or municipal governments accountable for the implementation. So there's a direct benefit uh, uh, and, uh, and, and monitoring of, of course is, is, a, is a key point. So with this actually, I'd like to stop and I would, uh, uh, I would be happy to uh, answer questions uh, and clarify yeah? uh, any issues uh, with the Mongolia's experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tarad. I think that the experience of community development agreements um, in particular is kind of the next, the next um, stage and can benefit greatly from uh, the nat from what's happening with um, host country agreements, but with even more room to grow. One thing that I think that's unique about Mongolia or that's important to note about Mongolia is the migratory nature of some of the communities. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak to the challenges that that presents um, or opportunities, if one may, and how, how one can, um, uh, what that implies for the, the topics of our discussion. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, I think, uh, the key challenges, as we uh, remember, uh, because I was also a participant at that uh, 2014 December multi-stakeholder uh, uh, forum on, on contract disclosure, uh, one of the key uh, challenges, uh, key, key challenges were uh, uh, both the uh, implementation and monitoring, uh, implementation of the, uh, the contracts, including the community development agreements, and the monitoring, uh, let's say, co uh, constant wise, you know, because of course, uh, 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 that time, of course, we had, a, especially at the local level, even a challenge with the internet connections, you know, uh, 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 and, and, and of course, the, uh, the access, let's say, to, um, uh, to the information, uh, uh, and including to the uh, internet, you know, like a basic things uh, were not there, uh, especially in the remote, you know, rural areas. Uh, so people, local uh, people were not uh, always, let's say, aware uh, of these contracts, uh, not to say, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the proper mining and exploration contracts, but even community development agreements, you know, of which they should uh, take a direct benefit. So this is what I would like to highlight. And I think uh, 
uh, the um, uh, what we are now, uh, let's say, very strongly advocating is uh, not just, let's say, uh, 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 government license of the mining uh, exploration and extraction, but also promoting more social license for mining. So this is, I think, the the the, uh, the, the I think uh, the the challenge: how we convert the government license, the mining license, uh, into social license, uh, which would benefit the local community, especially. So this is, I think, area we should focus in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time, but I want to go uh, literally give our panelists each thirty seconds. Um, maybe to focus on, um, on one of the most critical uh, call to actions for 2021 for the various EITI stakeholders or national stakeholders and what can be done to advance this norm um, or something that is a priority for you. So I'll give you 30 seconds to think about that as I try to capture some of the takeaways of this very rich conversation. Um, I think we've heard from really diverse perspectives and geographies, the important contributions that contract transparency can play in, um, in hoping to facilitate better contracts in the first place, better terms, because uh, daylight um, discourages corrupt um, or bad deals, that it facilitates their implementation at the national level, fac facilitates engagement of civil society, both in managing expectations and engaging with the government in the management of the sector, and facilitating engagement of communities and others in, in understanding and monitoring um, the terms. But we also heard many of the challenges that lay ahead. Um, Torad was just reminding us part of it is just the awareness of the relevant contracts in the first place. Then there's the issues of accessibility, um, those who still resist contract transparency as a norm, um, and even when it exists, having the resources and the support to understand and engage with the contracts and um, critically the safe space to engage. So those were at least um, some of the uh, really valuable points that our panelists raised. Um, I'll now invite each uh, in, the, in the order in which um, we heard from you to maybe share your 30 second um, call to action. So Don. Don, I can't hear you. I think, I think maybe others are having the same issue. Can you hear me now? Now we can, I'm yes. Sorry about that. Well, uh, apologies. And uh, let me say that it's been such a rich panel and a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, it's very hard to zero in on one point. But let me suggest that uh, maybe the most important next step is the normalization of having contracts in the public domain. Mark mentioned that the stakes are incredibly high. Uh, for many countries, these are vital revenues. And they need to be uh, overseen, they need to be supervised, they need to be managed well. And we need to transition from a period of time where it was normal for these things to be secret and for anyone who had copies of them to be under some kind of threat. Um, I've worked in, in jurisdictions uh, with civil society where we have worked with leaked contracts. It's a very concerning uh, dynamic. We need to move towards a world where it's normal for these to be in the public domain. And I have spent years working on these issues. I've read all the literature. I simply don't see any compelling argument for these contracts not to be in the public domain. So again, congrats to the people who put on the panel and for EITI and the innovation of, of taking us to the 1st of January where uh, contract transparency will become a requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And I think I speak on behalf of many of us to thank you also for your resources and analysis that has um, contributed not only to the success, but to its continued effect. So thank you so much. Diana? Yes, again, just to add amazing discussions, amazing topics. Um, you know, very hard to really abbreviate or to, to summarize everything, but maybe two key points, uh, an invitation, a call for action for all already implementing EITI countries uh, to not only disclose the contracts that uh, starting 2020, the ones that, have, that will be signed, but also to go to the existing ones that are already enforced and to also um, disclose these. And the second one, and this really means to us coming from Lebanon, is to treat contract transparency as a milestone and not an end in itself, to use that transparency to go for accountability and to um, use it to be part of the policy uh, drafting, reforms, you name it. But the end in itself is not contract disclosure. It's only a step.
Thank you so much, Dana. Uh, Mark? Yeah, so thank you again for having me on this on this panel. Um, I probably just just like to reiterate my my earlier point about you know it's not just about disclosing data or disclosing con uh, contracts, but it's really also about providing that broader um, context. And that that's where I think we as as EITI, and um, but also uh, as companies we have a role to play, can do you know can can really make can really make a difference. And I think that is at least to me. The most rewarding outcome of, of where we currently are as, as EITI. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Francis? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very, very good panel. Um, as we move to 1st January 2021, I would want us to think about uh, capacity building to enhance the impact of contract disclosure because all of us would be required mandatorily to um, meet these requirements as EITI implementing countries. But like my colleague said, what next? Is it just disclosing contracts or what do we need to do to ensure that the disclosure of contract has an impact on transparency, accountability and corruption? And it transforms the lives of the communities who are part of this contract. So I think uh, EITI should think about that and try to see how we can leverage the impact of contract disclosures come 2021. Thank you so much. Um, and Torad, any uh, final remarks? Uh, yes. So uh, I think, uh, again, I think it's a twin point. Um, one is that uh, the lessons learned uh, in Mongolia, uh, especially at the local level, uh, implementation and disclosure of the contracts is that uh, the process is as important as the end result. Meaning that if we involve the local communities, the civil society organizations from the start, you know, from the negotiations uh, stage uh, of the mining contracts, then the disclosure is also made, uh, let's say, easier. Uh, uh, and the, and the uh, other, I think, uh, side of the coin is that uh, we need to support especially the local communities, local civil society organizations to monitor the implementation of the mining contracts. Because uh, what the, again, Mongolia lessons was if the independent third parties uh, uh, play an important role, you know, in identifying gaps in the implementation opportunities for the improvement of the mining uh, contracts, but also in the overall national and local legal and policy frameworks uh, for the uh, uh, extractive uh, governance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what an enlightening panel. I'm also sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions that were asked, but I'm but I actually want to note that the questions came in from Mexico, from South Africa, from Nigeria. I'm just reminded that um, we're part of this global community where we can learn so much from these examples, um, from experiences. Um, Mexico, our participant from Mexico was humbled that Mongolia had uh, had benefited from that model. So it's just a reminder of how much we can learn from each other um, in the years ahead. So thanks again to all of our wonderful panelists. I look forward to this continued discussion. Um, Joanne, thanks again to EITI for convening this discussion. And let me turn it over to you to uh, to lead us out. Simply to say thank you to you, Lisa, for leading us through this discussion. It's been really fantastic. Um, and thank you to the panelists um, for sharing your really um, frank and fantastic examples um, from Mongolia, from Lebanon, from Sierra Leone, um, from all over the world to really um, bring to bear some, some knowledge and momentum and awareness around this important subject. Um, so we have many reasons now to look forward to 2021, um, not least um, the 1st of January deadline for, for more contract disclosure. Um, and certainly from EITI's perspective, we look forward to uh, broadening and deepening engagement and really taking on some of the questions that have been raised in this fantastic webinar. So thank you, uh, participants. Thank you, panelists. And thank you, um, most of all, Lisa, um, for your wonderful facilitation. Um, we look forward to some more events under the Transpar Transparency Matters thank series in, in 2021 as well. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye for now.